All right, well, welcome everyone today. Uh, they gave me the opportunity to be guest speaker, so if it's great, praise God. If it's bad, blame the piano. <laughs> but anyway, on a more serious note, if you all will open your Bible to Matthew chapter 28, verses 16 through 20. to set the stage for you here. We're at the tail end of the book of Matthew. The 12, now dwindled down to 11, have spent three years living with Jesus, being taught by Jesus. They witness his crucifixion. They witness his resurrection. That's now 40 days later, and Christ has been spending all this time teaching them, okay, this is what I taught you. This is what I was trying to get at. And them having these light bulb moments like, aha, we get it now. So we pick up in verse 16 here. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore... Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and, teach the, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Now this story here, this passage, is oftentimes referred to as the Great Commission because it is the biggest and most important command that Christ gives us, and that is to take the gospel message that he has given us and share it with the world, to go out and proclaim the good news of Christ, which is what the very word gospel means, and why we refer to the first four books of the New Testament as the gospels, because this is the good news of Christ. Well, what is the good news of Christ? What is this great gospel we are asked to go out and to share with the whole world? The gospel as a whole, I think, is very well summed up in one particular verse. It's a very popular verse, one many of you probably already know, John 3, 16. Say it with me. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. That is the gospel message summed up in one simple verse, one nice package. Let's dig a little deeper, though, see what is the gospel message? What is it that we are asked to go and tell the world? Well, first, to understand the gospel message, we must first understand and be able to accept the condition that the world is in and that we are in before we meet Christ, before we have the power and the life-changing message of God's love and Jesus' sacrifice for our sins. And that is, as far as this world is concerned... The Titanic has hit the iceberg, the ship is going down, and it cannot be saved. Like it or not, at the beginning of mankind, at the beginning of the Bible, Adam and Eve sinned. And when they sinned, they sold themselves and all their descendants, which includes everyone in this church, everyone in this country, everyone in this entire world, into slavery to sin. And because of that, we are all born with a selfish, sinful nature that, by God's law, is deserving of punishment. The book of Romans, what I like about the book of Romans, it sets up a lot of different arguments about 
God about the gospel and does so in a pretty logical way. And the third chapter of Romans focuses a lot on this fact that the way we are born, the way we come into this world before Christ is as sinful people. And in the 10th verse of the chapter, it says that there is no one righteous, no, not one. And later on in the 23rd verse, it says, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So what do we do about this sin nature? The problem is, on our own, of our own strength, of our own will, of our own merit, there is nothing we can do. On, if you go on YouTube, you can find a video. I chose not to share it for time's sake, but if you have time, I would strongly recommend it. It's called Jesus Loves Barabbas. It's an excerpt from a sermon by Judah Smith, and in it he's talking about this very same thing, and he's saying, you know, now that I'm in this deep, dark pit, what am I going to do? And my reaction is, I'm going to shake it off. I'm going to rise up. I'm going to get over it. And he's like, no, don't. You are no match for sin on your own. You cannot overcome it of your own will and of your own power. And no matter how hard you try, you will stay in the same rut of your own will and power. That is the truth of the condition the world is in and the condition we are born into. But what about the good news of the gospel? What is this good news in light of this terrible situation we find ourselves in? And the good news is this, that though this world is filled with sin, though this world is doomed to destruction, that though the Titanic has hit the iceberg and it's going down, there is a lifeboat. Just because you are born into this sin-filled world, that is doomed to one day die, you do not have to go down with the ship. And that lifeboat is Jesus Christ. You see, even though God's law says that our sin nature means we deserve punishment, he also loved us enough that he gave him his son, to take our place. For you see, when Jesus died on the cross, when God's perfect son, the one person who was not filled with sin, who was not condemned by the curse of sin, he took upon himself all the sins of the world, past, present, and future, so that he would pay the punishment for us and we wouldn't have to. Romans 6, 23 says, for the wages of sin is death. That's the bad news I just got done through saying. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. And in John 1 verse 12, he said, John says, says, talking about Christ, that to all who believe in him, who are called by his name, gave he the right to be called children of God. Now, this is pretty good news, isn't it? So, why do we share this good news, and why do we go out and tell it? Because nothing else in this world has the power to change lives and to free people from sin. Nothing. 
and it can do some pretty miraculous things, too. At the church I go to out in Indiana, for example, I'll, I've got one friend. His name is Jeff Davis. Uh, Jeff, he's now a Christian, but he wasn't always that way. Uh, he grew up in a Christian household, or well, at least going to church but never really accepted Christ and got himself involved in drugs, had fathered a daughter out of wedlock, had been in and out of prison. But then in his last time in prison, he finally gave his heart to Christ and allowed the gospel message, the good news of Christ's saving power into his life And it completely changed who he was. About a year ago, on June 1st of last year, the same friend of mine was driving home from church on his moped, and an intoxicated driver runs a stop sign and nails him. And I spent much time over the summer uh, trying to minister to him by helping him go around and take care of his errands. But one day while I was trying to minister to him, the tables got turned and he ministered to me instead. You see, we had gone to the pharmacy to pick up some prescriptions for the pain he was having because of the accident. And a girl comes out who's not dressed very modestly. And what does Jeff do? holds his hands up and turns away. He's like, oh, Drake, I wish he, I wish he wouldn't be like that because he's causing me to sin. And I was like, well, wait a minute. See this guy who was once in prison, involved in drugs? Now he's going to great lengths to avoid anything that might encourage sinful thoughts. And if he can do that, why shouldn't I be able to? Another interesting time I got to see the way that the gospel can change a person's life. Another fella came to our church, Jim was his name, started coming in June of 2013. The following September, his wife Tracy starts coming. And on the second Sunday that Tracy was there, she stands up during the given time of the service and shares a testimony that I'll never forget no matter how long I live. You see, the previous June, shortly before Jim had started coming to the church, she had gone to her husband and said, I want a divorce. I want out of this marriage. And what Jim did is he began seeking a solution and found his way to God and accepted the gospel, accepted the good news and the saving power of Christ. And it completely changed who he was. And Tracy had noticed this, and that's why she had come to church to try and see, you know, what, what is it about this gospel, about this Jesus, that has changed my husband so much? And that Sunday in front of the whole church, after she had finished saying this, she asked her husband to stand up in front of the whole church, says to her husband that she forgives him and that she no longer wants a divorce. And for them, it didn't even stop there. The following note, they started bringing their children as well. And by Christmas time, the whole family had been saved And we as a church got the privilege of watching Christ save this family that was on the brink of destruction. This is what the gospel can do. And this is why Jesus tells us to go out and make disciples of every nation to share the good news of Christ so that they too can know what it is like to have that life-changing 
forgiveness, that power of Christ that can change a person's soul, change a person's very being more than anything else, more than the greatest motivational speaker in the world, more than the strongest will, more than the greatest passion, the one thing that can achieve true change and it can save them from the self-destructive tendencies of sin. Now, my dad, obviously, you know, he's a pastor. He's pastoring here at this church. He's pastored at other churches, mostly in the Midwest, but also in Pennsylvania. I myself am studying to go into ministry and as of recently have come to the conclusion that I believe God is calling me to eventually go into mission work. But you don't have to be a pastor or a missionary or an evangelist to fulfill the Great Commission to share the gospel. We got lots of people here who need the gospel of Christ and need the power. We've got people in Folks Run, Matthias, Timberville, Newmarket, Broadway, Harrisonburg, the people you work with, the people you go to school with, the people you see at the grocery store, lots of people in this area alone who could use that life-changing gospel, who could be just transformed by the power of the renewing that Christ brings. Now, I did include one video as a visual aid, one that I think does a pretty good job of explaining, uh, in a metaphorical sense, the situation we find ourselves in and what Christ and the gospel message does for us in that situation. In a little while, I'm going to have it be played, and my challenge to you is while it is playing, just think to yourselves, how can I fulfill the Great Commission in my own life and with the people around me? Who in my life needs this gospel message, and how can I be the hands and feet of God going down to where to the hole that they find themselves in and helping and giving them the message that they need to get carried up out of that pit into the light and saving knowledge of Christ. A man fell in the hole. He fell in a hole, and he couldn't get out. A traveler passed by. He told the man to meditate, to purify his mind, and when he reached Nirvana, all suffering would cease. The man did as he was told, but he remained in the hole. Another man appeared. He explained that the hole didn't exist, and neither, in fact, did the man. It was all an illusion. The man who did not exist was still stuck in the hole that was not there. Another visitor arrived. He instructed the man to perform good deeds to improve his karma, and though he would still die in the hole, he might be reincarnated as something magnificent. Another man looked down from above. He taught the man to pray five times a day facing east and to follow five important tenets. If he was faithful, one day, perhaps, the divine would set him free. The man prayed as best he could, but he was losing strength. And in the hole he remained.
another man appeared. There was something different about him. He called down to the man in the hole and asked him if he wanted to be free. into the earth, into the pit. He took hold of the man and dragged him into the light. And the man in the hole, who could not get himself out, was saved. So while you have those people in your mind, I just want to encourage you to seek opportunities to share the gospel and to persevere because I guarantee you if you want to get on the enemy's hit list, the quickest way to do it is to do the work of Christ. But is there any greater thing that Christ has called us to do than to be his hands and feet and to minister his love and his gospel to, to a lost and dying world? Uh, with that, I'll say a quick prayer and then we'll hand it back over to the music people to wrap up our service. Dear Jesus, we thank you for this week and for the time you have given us. We thank you, Lord, for the people you have put in our lives who have shared with us your gospel message and your good news. And for the people you have put in our lives to whom we can share your gospel and your good news. Lord God, we pray for courage to share your word and to proclaim your gospel boldly and without fear. We pray, Lord, for opportunity to share your word and to be your hands and feet to a world that is full of sin and suffering. Lord, we pray for your Holy Spirit to guide us to the people you would have us to reach and to give us your words. Lord God, we just pray for this community and for the people in it. In Jesus' name, amen.